Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> uh, we are we are <coughs> going to have the Gen five day Genzoe from uh, Wednesday. For that, uh, people who came from Europe, Gyoet uh, from Italy and uh, Shoich from France, uh, and we we'll have many other people coming. So. Uh, I really appreciate people who come far away to practice and study Dogen Zen teaching. Uh, so next Sunday we will not have a usual Sunday activity, but if you wish to participate, the, listen to my lecture. We, uh, my lecture will be 10 to 10.30. 9 to 10.30. 9 to, 9 to 10.30, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, They've never been that short. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, today I'd like to continue to talk on this, this text, Opening the Hand of Thought, uh, page uh, 100, if we have this book. One, two, third paragraph of page 100. Uh, let me read this paragraph. <clears throat> Returning to the question of self, I too am an interdependent existence that is impermanent and at the same time takes a particular form. Buddhism teaches that our attachment to ourself as though it were a substantial being is the source of our greed, anger, suffering, and strife. It is crucial that we reflect thoroughly on the fact that our self does not have a substantial existence. Rather, it has an interdependent existence. Uh, in this section of this book, uh, he's talking about the meaning or significance of Zazen practice in the context of modern civilization. And uh, in the introduction of this section, he said the uh, nature of modern civilization uh, as a, a kind of a, a scientific and technological civilization uh, that is a very materialistic uh, has that kind has as a uh, driving force. Uh, dissatisfaction. We are not happy about who we are or what the condition we are living in, so we want to make it better. So this dissatisfaction is the basic motivation of to uh, make progress. Therefore, we need to work hard to achieve and reach that goal. We think better than who we are or of where we are. But uh, Uchamori pointed out when we reach that uh, goal, we have another dissatisfaction. So within this uh, dissatisfaction, there's no end. And uh, if we practice, also live in this way, with this uh, motivation, it's very difficult or, or almost impossible to find a peace of mind because we are always going somewhere where, and we always don't like who we are or where we are. Uh, but Uchamuro is pointing out we need a middle way. Uh, that means uh, we cannot negate the progress. Of course, it's, it's true that our 
who we are or where we are is not a paradise or perfect. we are not perfect. We have so many problems and difficulty, so we have to make effort to make progress and to improve ourselves. And yet, uh, we cannot be happy without peace of mind. So how can we uh, live both uh, our effort for progress and peace of mind can be there? And uh, <coughs> uh, he said uh, there is a meaning of this Zazen practice based on Buddhist teaching of middle way to find uh, how both are possible. And uh, he started to talk, talk about uh, Zazen practice as a Buddhist teaching. And uh, he said, Ujjamuri said, the basic attitude of Buddhism from the time of Shakyamuni is to settle down within the self, not going out. But within this self, we need to we find the uh, energy to change, to make change. So not to reach the goal, but to uh, live our life force. We have to make effort. So uh, you know, in the Buddhist teaching, we Buddha always talk. We need to be free from desire, greed and dissatisfaction and yet and yet we need to be uh, diligent so diligent diligence is one of the eightfold noble path i mean eightfold correct path and also the one of the six parameters so uh, how can we work hard or practice diligently, without desire, mm -hmm. without dissatisfaction. That is very important point of our life. That is what Uchamura is saying. And, to, uh, and he started to talk about what is this self, uh, according to uh, Buddha's teaching. And he started to talk about the middle way between uh, who and who? Sorry. Who is being and who is non being? But uh, the uh, one of the definition of emptiness or who is neither who nor mu. He means no. Not being and not non-being. That is how this middle way is pointed. That means if we think there is a one fixed entity as self, then that is a mistake. But if we think there is no such thing, then that is another mistake. So we should be free from both view. And that reality, neither u nor mu, is called ku, or emptiness. And uh, he said, our body, he uh, talked about his album, in which he put uh, his photos since he was born as a baby and uh, every few years he, he you know took a photo and put on in that album until he became pretty old and he see how different his uh, face is his face was and he said not only his face or his appearance but also uh, things inside our body, which 
cannot be taken by the photo uh, is also changing. So his body is changing and also his mind, how he think, what he think, what he likes or what he dislikes are always are also changing. So there's no fixed uh, thing, either body or mind. Body, our body and mind are always changing. Still, we think there's something which doesn't change. Otherwise, we cannot say, you know, uh, you know, in my case, uh, 66 years ago, I was a tiny baby, and I became a boy. I became a teenager. I became a uh, young monk, and now I'm a, a old man, old priest. You know, I have to say I was this such and such, and I am such and such. You know, this I, if this I is different things, then whatever I say doesn't make any sense. Because this I, if it doesn't change, goes through the uh, change. That is how we think. So, fat this I, which we usually think doesn't change. When uh, I was a baby, I was an I, and when I'm an older person, I'm still I. So there's some identity which doesn't change. But what is this? Is uh, the uh, point of this Uchamurashi discussion. And he, he, what he's saying is this I is neither U. It doesn't really uh, exist as a fixed entity that doesn't change. And that we cannot say uh, there's no such thing called Shohaku. Shohaku has been living in certain way. So I cannot say, you know, uh, this is not important. And this is unique. You know, I'm not you and you are not me, and I cannot live like you, and you cannot live like me. So this individuality and also uniqueness of uh, this I, which has neither U nor B nor uh, Mu, is important. So we need to see from both sides. You know, this Shohaku is like, a, uh, as Uchamro said, like a frame or a bubble or uh, all other things that seems it's there, but it things are always changing. Nothing stay forever, and we are the same. That is how we see this I or self uh, as a middle way. That is what he is saying here in this paragraph. And uh, so he returned to the self, I. I am an interdependent existence. That means uh, neither U nor B nor Mu, but uh, empty or emptiness. Uh, that is impermanent and at the same time takes a, a particular form. So in that sense, we cannot say there is no such thing. But we also can say there is such a fixed thing. Then, uh, next sentence, which I'm going to say, Buddhism teaches that our attachment to ourself, our attachment to ourself, as, so, as though it were a substantial being. So, we attach to this I as if this I is something substantial. Substantial means it doesn't change. It is always the same. Uh, so uh, this, our attachment to this I is the source of uh, greed, anger, suffering, and strife. That, that, that those problems 
came from our attachment to this view that we are here existing and doesn't change. But such thing, such fixed self does not exist is uh, the teaching of Buddhism. That means we cannot cling or attach ourselves to the self. The self, uh, according to Buddha's teaching, a uh, collection of five aggregate. That is, you know, form, uh, sensation, perception, formation, and consciousness. These are called the five scandals. And uh, form refer to material. And in our case, our body, our body is form. And other four aggregates are function of our mind. So we are the collection of these five elements. And those five elements or five aggregates are only there. But somehow, uh, these five aggregate, because, because of the uh, function of our mind, somehow we produce this idea or concept called I or me. And we attach this as most important thing. And as Uchamaru said, this is the problem, source of the problem we have. And at this point, about this point, uh, you know, he's talking from Mahayana uh, Buddhist point of view, but uh, there's no difference between uh, Ali Buddhism and Mahayana Buddhism and even the Theravada Buddhism. So uh, I don't think we need to uh, talk about this too much, but I'd like to introduce what is said in Theravada tradition about this point. So we can see the <coughs> uh, about this point, the self and what is the cause of suffering uh, is exactly the same uh, between Theravada Buddhism or Ali Buddhism or Theravada Buddhism or Mahayana Buddhism and even Zen. Uh, this is a very good book, The Fat the Buddha Taught. This is about a very basic teaching of uh, Buddhism. So uh, if you are interested in studying the very basis of Buddhist teaching, uh, I recommend you this book. Anyway, uh, in the beginning of this book, this person, uh, Walpora Lafla uh, talks about four noble truths. Uh, of course, four noble truths is a very basic teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha or Buddhism uh, in any traditions. And uh, of course, first truth, first of the four noble truths uh, is suffering, the truth of suffering. So uh, this is, is from the part he or uh, Lafra discuss about what is suffering. And uh, in Buddhism, it says there are three kinds of sufferings. Uh, in this book, uh, his translation, those three kinds of suffering are First, dukkha. Suffering is dukkha in Pali. K K H -E, dukkha. And first kind is called dukkha dukkha. <laughs> or in uh, Chinese and Japanese, we call it ku ku. Ku is suffering. So just repeat, ku ku. And this is ordinary kind of suffering we experience 
you know, in Buddhism it said there are eight kind, eight, eight sufferings or eight kind of suffering. Those are, you know, birth, uh, aging or old age, sickness and dying are uh, first four kind of sufferings or dukkha. And uh, six, uh, there are another four. And six is the suffering we experience when uh, we cannot get what we want. I think we all have experience of this kind of <laughs> suffering or dissatisfaction. And uh, that is fifth. Six is uh, suffering when we experience when uh, we need to separate from people we love. And we also, I think all of us have this experience. And the next one, uh, seventh, is the suffering we experience when we have to be together with people we don't like. <laughs> and we always have this kind of problem. <laughs> So those first, those seven kind of suffering or this this satisfaction uh, are what we experience, and those are called kuku or dukkha dukkha, or no, those are ordinary suffering. And second kind is in Japanese or Chinese called eku. A means destruction, Des I'm sorry, destruction, Des that means changing. And uh, in his translation, uh, this is uh, dukkha as uh, produced by change. And he explained a happy feeling, a happy condition in life is not permanent not everlasting. It changes sooner or later. So we feel suffering when things changing because everything is uh, you know, changing impermanent, uh, you know, even though when we have some kind of happiness or satisfaction or success, uh, sooner or later it's gone, it's gone. So we have to open our hand. Then we feel suffering. That kind of suffering is called suffering as uh, made of changes. You know, we expect happiness and success last forever, and yet it doesn't. So we have we feel suffering. That is the second kind. And the third kind of suffering is, uh, he said, kind of difficult to understand and kind of unusual, but most important. That is called, in Japanese or uh, Chinese, called yoku. Yoku. Yo is a trans, is a fourth of five scandals. Sanskara in Sanskrit and in Pali Sankara. And about uh, yoke, uh, this, uh, this book translate or explain as a conditioned state. Dukkha as conditioned state. Sankara Dukkha. And this is interesting and uh, important to understand what is this suffering, this kind of suffering. So let me read what he is saying. He says, but the third form of dukkha, uh, as conditioned state, states, is the most important philosophical aspect of the first noble truth. And it requires some analytical explanation of what we consider as a being 
as an individual or as I. So in order to understand this kind of dukkha or suffering, he said, we need to understand what this I is. And he continued, what we call a being, this being, or an individual, or I, according to Buddhist philosophy, is only a combination of ever-changing physical and mental forces or energies, which may be divided into five groups. Those are five scandals or aggregates. This is uh, Pancha uh, Kanda. And the Buddha says, the Buddha says, in short, these five aggregates, these five aggregates of attachment are dukkha. So he's saying these five aggregate, five skandhas are dukkha. Uh, this uh, well, expression, five aggregates of attachment, is uh, pancha upadana skanda. These five skandhas are the attachment, or are the object of attachment. And the subject of attachment is also five skandhas. So these five skandhas attach themselves and that is suffering that is itself suffering this is what buddha said and elsewhere he distinctly defined dukkha as the five aggregate so this five aggregate means our body and mind our body and mind as conditioned body and mind, conditioned means in, interdependent, is itself dukkha. Uh, this is what the Buddha said. Oh, because what is dukkha? It should be said that it is the five aggregates of attachment. Here it should be clearly understood that dukkha and the five aggregates are not two different things. That means this body and mind and suffering are not two things. That means uh, suffering is not what we experience, but these five scanners or our body and mind are themselves dukkha. This is very interesting. That means there's no way to escape from <laughs> <laughs> this dukkha. Because we are dukkha. Uh, so uh, dukkha and the five aggregate, aggregates are not two different things. The five aggregates themselves are dukkha. We will understand this point better when we have some notion of the five aggregates which constitute the so-called being. Then uh, Lafra uh, make explanation of what these five are. But I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, After uh, his explanation of what are these five, he says, very briefly, these are the five aggregates. What we call a being, being or individual or I, is only a convenient name, convenient name for a label, label, L -A -B -L, label, given to the combination of these five groups. So this I is a convenient name for these five scandals. Uh, they are all impermanent, 
all constantly changing. Whatever is impermanent is dukkha. So all five skandhas are impermanent, therefore all five skandhas are themselves dukkha or suffering. This is the true meaning of the Buddha's word. In brief, the five aggregates of attachment are dukkha. Then, so when or as far as five aggregates attach themselves to five aggregates, that is uh, upadana dukkha, uka, upadana aggregates or uh, skandhas, and that is suffering. Then, uh, next page, he says, uh, one thing disappears, conditioning the appearance of the next in a series of cause and effect. So things are allowed, stay for a while, changing and disappear. The next thing appears. This is what impermanence means. Uh, there is nothing behind them. There is nothing behind them. That means nothing is there's nothing which allies, and nothing which changes, nothing which stay and change, and nothing disappear. Only arising, uh, staying, uh, changing, and disappearing are there. So this is something happening. And there's no fixed thing that is changing. This changing is our life. Uh, so there is nothing behind this change, this movement. That can be called a permanent self, or this is called Atma. Individuality, or anything that can, in reality, be called I. When I, we think and when we speak, I have to say uh, I'm changing. But uh, according to the Buddha, there's no such I which is changing. Only changing is there. Everyone will agree that neither matter nor sensation, nor perception, nor any one of those mental activities that are uh, four scandals. Nor consciousness can really be called I. But, uh, Buddhists really like this word, but, <laughs> or however. <laughs> But when these five physical and mental aggregates, which are interdependent, it's interesting to me, this person used this word interdependent, mm. inter instead of dependent, mm. which are interdependent, are working together in combination as a physio-psychological machine. Mm. So this is like a machine we get the idea of I. So this I is a production of this machine of five scanners. Then somehow our body and mind works together as a machine. Then we create this I, this concept I, which doesn't change. And without this I, we cannot even talk about change. So, in our thinking, or in our communication, uh, this eye is really important. That I think that is why we reify this eye as a fixed uh, substantial entity. And this eye is the owner of these five scandals and operate this five scan, this body and mind. And we are the kind of a possession our five scandals are possession of this I. Possession. Possession. Uh, uh, belongings. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, in these five uh, physio-psychological machines, we get the idea of I. But this is only a false idea. Uh, I'm not sure this word false is uh, correct or uh, appropriate or, or not, but actually, uh, at least this is a fix, uh, fiction. Fiction. It's not a false. I don't think it's false because we need it to think. But we can say this is a fiction. It's not a real thing. A mental formation, this is a, a mental formation or product of our mind, which is nothing but one of those 52 mental formations. That means this formation creates this concept of I. Of the four, fourth aggregate, which we have just discussed, Namely, it is the idea of self. And he says, these five aggregates together, which we popularly call a being, and dukkha itself. So when we, we means uh, five skandhas, think this is real thing, and we are belong to this I, and uh, this I is the owner of this body and mind, and uh, we are that kind of a tool to satisfy this I, then our life becomes suffering. Mm. Because we, are, we became like a servant of some idea or a concept which doesn't really there. These five aggregate, uh, aggregate together, which we popularly call a being, a uh, dukkha itself. There is no other being or I standing behind these five aggregates who experiences dukkha. So as Buddha Gosha said, Buddha Gosha is very important Theravada uh, monk scholars. Uh, Buddha Gosa says, more, I'm sorry, mea, M-E-R-E, mea suffering exists, but no sufferer is found. The deeds are, the deeds or actions are, but no doer, doer, D-O-E-R, the person who is uh, suffering. So these are, but no dua is found. So movement is really happening, and yet no one is doing that thing. And this is very important point in Mahayana, uh, Mahayana teaching, such as uh, Nagarjuna's Majanka Karika. He, Nagarjuna discussed uh, you know, there's no such, uh, for example, when someone is running, we say, this person is running. But he said, Nagarjuna discussed, uh, if there's this runner and running, if there are two things, then this runner uh, doesn't run. If runner and running are the two different things. This person, this runner, is running. But this is a strange thing. But there, so what, basically what Nagarjuna is saying is, saying is there is no runner beside running. Only running. In the same way, there is suffering, but there is no sufferer. Uh, and he, uh, Lafla continues, there is no unmoving mover, unmoving mover behind the movement. So there's no eye uh, which doesn't change beside changing. 
so the process of changing ri there's no such i which that doesn't change uh, which is going through the uh, process of changing so this is a really important point uh, it is not correct to say that life is moving he said it is not correct to say that life is moving but life is movement itself life is movement itself life and movement are not two different things in other words there is no thinker behind the thought there's no thinker behind the thought thought itself is the thinker if you remove the thought there is no thinker to be found here we cannot fail to notice how this Buddhist view is uh, diametrically opposed to the Cartesian, Cartesian? Uh, cogito ego sum. Mm -hmm. I think, therefore I am. So there is no such I which is thinking. But only the action of thinking is there. <clears throat> uh, this is how uh, this person, Rafra, explained about uh, suffering and five scandals. And uh, five scandals produce this I, which doesn't change, and the owner of five scandals. And we attach to ourselves. That is why we suffer. And there is no we, only suffering. So, important point is uh, he's talking about uh, what is suffering. He's talking about the first noble truth. And uh, according to this, our, bo bo our body and mind are themselves suffering. So there is no way to escape because our existence itself is suffering. But we need to understand this is only the first noble truth. Then uh, Buddha and, and uh, this book discussed what is the cause of this suffering. And, uh, and it, Buddha and this book also said uh, it is possible to uh, cessation of suffering. So this suffering can be ceased. And there is a path uh, we can walk uh, to lead the cessation of suffering. So uh, this is a very interesting point. You know, we are ourselves, our existence, our five standards are themselves suffering. So there is no escape. And yet there is a path which can lead us to the cessation of suffering. That means, uh, in a sense, cessation of five scandals. Mm. That means we, we can lead the cessation of five scandals, or at least cessation of uh, upadana five scandals. And as I often say, in the Mahayana teaching, such as the Heart Sutra, in the first sentence of the Heart Sutra, it says, Avalokiteshvara Bodhisattva, when deeply practicing Prajna Paramita, clearly see the emptiness of five scandals and relieve all sufferings. So what the Heart Sutra is saying and what the Buddha taught is exactly the same thing. That means uh, the Heart Sutra is about the prajna, about the wisdom. And wisdom is one of the uh, six parameters. And six parameters and eightfold correct path is the same thing. 
I think you know, you, all of you know the, it for the correct path. That is a correct or right thinking. Uh, I don't remember in English. <laughs> I have to uh, think in Japanese. Show can show she show. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is for myself. Show go show go show myo show show jin and show men and show jo. Uh, show is right or correct, and the K is view. She is thought and go is speech and go is action and myo is livelihood and shojin is diligence and nen is mindfulness and jo is samadhi. Those are eight for noble paths. And uh, in the case of the six parameters, these first two are wisdom or prajna parameter. And the next three are included in the sila parameter. Sila is precept. Uh, and shojin is the same, diligence is the same. And uh, mindfulness and samadhi are include uh, uh, but samadhi, yeah, concentration. So in the case of six parameters, two things are added to the eight uh, for the correct path. Those two are dana. Dana is offering and patience. Of offering dana and patience are not included in the eight, eight fourth correct path. So in a, in a sense, six parameter is uh, ten fourth correct path. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for uh, Mahayana Buddhist, you know, both dana and patience are about between or among the people. Mm. So to practice and work together with people are important in Mahayana teachings. I think that's why dana or offering or giving and patience are, are added. So basically eightfold correct path and six parameters are the same thing, same practice. So what the Hatha Sutra says in the first sentence is when we see the emptiness of five scandals means we see the fictitious nature of I then we are released from suffering and in that case uh, you know five scandals cease to be the uh, five upadana scandals that means we, when we see emptiness of five scandals, we see there's no way to cling to, mm. to attach ourselves to five scandals because they are empty. When we see the empty, emptiness of five scandals, we are released from clinging to five scandals. That is prajna. Then we are relieved by, or from all sufferings. So. You know, this teaching in the early Buddhism and what uh, the Heart Sutra is saying is to me exactly the same thing. That means this is talking about the cause of suffering, cause of suffering, how our life becomes suffering. And uh, the Heart Sutra is saying is how we can be released from that kind of suffering. Then the Heart Sutra. No, not this is Hat Sutra, but Dogen. Dogen's comment on, on the Hat Sutra 
in Shobo Genzo Makahanya Haramitsu Dogen said these five scandals are five instances of prajna. So the, uh, when we see the emptiness of these five scandals, then the name are changes. These five scandals are themselves prajna. And these five scandals function as Avalokiteshvara. When we are released from self-clinging, clinging to our five scandals, so seeing the emptiness of five scandals means we see there's no uh, separation between these five scandals and other five scandals because we are all five scandals and these all five scandals are always coming and going, nothing stay. Then uh, we see that we are living together all, with all beings. That is what uh, uh, these five scandals as uh, prajna works. So same thing, same thing function in the opposite way. And then uh, there's a upada, these five scandals are uparana, that means clinging or attachment. Then this is called mara. But when we are released from that attachment and see the emptiness of five scandals and uh, live and work or practice based on this prajna, then these five scandals is called Avalokiteshvara. So there is no such thing called Avalokiteshvara besides five scandals. So when it is said Avalokiteshvara uh, see the emptiness of five scandals, means five scandals see the emptiness of five scandals. So there is no uh, subject-object relation. You know, we cannot really see five, five scandals as an object. Oh, this is five scandals. So in, the, in that case, there is no such separation <coughs> between subject and object. So uh, this prajna has no such uh, person who see the reality of five scandals. But five scandals see the emptiness of five scandals. Same as five scandals attach themselves to five scandals. So only five scandals are there. And depending upon whether we attach to the five scandals or these five scandals see the emptiness of five scandals, uh, the name is different, but actually the same thing. To me, this is a really important point of Buddhism. So about this point, there's no difference or contradiction or discrepancy between Ali Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, or Theravada Buddhism. So our practice, how we can uh, see and, uh, and become free from our clinging to these five scandals and live together with other five scandals in harmony. Well, this is what I have to say this morning. <laughs> Any question? <laughs> Please. Does five scandals refers in Buddhism only to human beings? I think that was the same question. <laughs> I think Charlotte gave. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think uh, include all living beings. All living beings. Not only the being beings, all the beings, because uh, form or rupa means material. So even uh, inanimate beings are, well, I, but I'm not sure if they have four other <laughs> scandals. <laughs> but this is a kind of in, in, important point when we study Shobogen's or Butsuko Joji, that is what we are going to. Uh, study during the Genzo. Okay. Please. <clears throat> so when we are 
are talking about the five skandhas, and uh, and, and there's attachment mm -hmm. to and um, then there's suffering. Mm -hmm. But those five skandhas can still exist, except there's no attachment, mm -hmm. which means that the new term for that mm -hmm. is Avalokiteshvara. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? I think so. Well, so name key. changed. Yeah, the name changed. <laughs> and the but function it, changed. It's because the, the relation... It's not a relationship. It's a realization. Mm -hmm. Awakening. Yeah. So in that sense, that is not this prajna is not our thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that not, why that why I think Dogen says, "Don't think, but sit." Yeah. When we sit, uh, we are free even from the thinking that five skandhas are empty. Mm -hmm. If we think, sit facing the wall and think five skandhas are empty, then this person is think, thinking about the five skandhas and about the concept of emptiness. When we do such a thing, we are not free at all. Mm -hmm. There's a separation between person thinking and the object, five skandhas, and the emptiness. So this is still happening in our mind. So when Dogen said, said just sit, means even stop thinking about the emptiness of five skandhas. Because emptiness of five skandhas is not empty, uh -huh. but only thinking. So when that is the mode, that there's mm. thinking and there's attachment to the five skandhas, mm. it would seem to me that one of the results of that are um, greed, hatred, mm. etc. Mm. But the result of not being attached to the five skandhas mm. are love, compassion, equanimity. Yeah. yeah, and responsibility too. We have resp responsibility to take, to take care of these five skandhas. Of just these five skandhas or all five skandhas? <laughs> all five skandhas. Yeah, yeah. See, from my perspective, that did, that's referring to a human, well, I guess the word right now is a human being or a set of five skandhas that is flourishing, which is different than just me. Thriving is about just me. Flourishing is about us. Right. So uh, by seeing the emptiness of five skandhas, mm -hmm. we see we are one with all beings. Mm -hmm. Therefore, all beings are uh, in Zen or Mahayana Buddhist expression that is true self. Mm -hmm. True self is no self, or no self is true self. Anything else? Yeah, one more. Please. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I just, I'm so connected to the fact that the Buddha, in his body, he um, aged, he grew sick, and he mm -hmm. died. Mm -hmm. So at that level, is that the ordinary level of suffering that we were talking about? The first level, the first form of yeah. suffering, dukkha dukkha. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So that kind of suffering, even Shakyamuni uh, had to experience, is not really the dukkha. It's a con human condition. We need to live, live together. Okay, okay. So he could; those could be experiences for his body, but because he's not attached, there's not suffering. Right. So suffering and pain might be different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. When Shakyamuni left his palace, ah. he saw the sick person, uh, uh, aged person, sick person, and, and uh, dead person, and he, he left home to f find how to become free from, liberated from those sufferings. And he, when he attained enlightenment or awakening and became Buddha, he became free from all the all of them. But more than 40 years later, when he died, he experienced exactly the same thing. So we need to understand what happened when he became Buddha. There's something different. 
and yet he had the same kind of, I think he had to go through the same kind of uh, pain. Yeah. You know, Buddha himself said, I had pain when he died. So his enlightenment is not a pain killer. <laughs> I guess. But it's the cure to the suffering. Yeah. So the quality has changed, I think. To, to, to me, the great mystery, and maybe it has to stay a mystery, is what happened when Buddha became Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me mm -hmm. that you could go back to your runner and doer and mm -hmm. running. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me you could just as logically say mm -hmm. that the reality is that there was a runner and a doer. There's no distinction that makes the jump to say it has to be changed and be fixed. I don't believe it, but you, you could make that argument that it's just as, that it exists in time, and time is moving mm -hmm. uh, in in the third kind of time you've talked about uh, mm -hmm. as an internal time uh, mm -hmm. that cert that comes back on itself. Mm -hmm. um, but then that moment would still always exist and come back. And so whatever exists in that time mm -hmm. as a doer mm -hmm. would also exist as a runner. And so I don't think you escape that. Mm -hmm. It also seems to me that you can make just as logical an argument that cessation mm -hmm. for the Buddha as a corporal Buddha mm -hmm. and me as an ordinary being are exactly mm -hmm. the same upon death. And the issue then does come back to what is that element that makes a Buddha a Buddha that still has an aspect of self to it that reincarnates and allows you to achieve greater perfect, perfection over time through developing good karma. That, that's what I don't get. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Nick. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, but I have no explanation about that. Uh, could anyone give him the answer? Could I add to his fire? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I saw a video uh, interview recently of a man, the right half of his face is melted and it doesn't function any longer. The right hand is very contorted and the skin also melted. The left side of his face is very expressive. And he's talking about having been in a plane crash where his body's on fire and he's he's brought to safety and his body dies and then comes back to life. And he's telling the story of what happened while he was dead. And it's a story that you're likely familiar with, the general themes of uh, near-death experiences or death experiences where his perceptions were so clear and the sense of hearing and seeing, tasting, touching, smelling, touch, was so much more acute. And there was this sense of a tractor beam, something drawing him up and forward into this great light that was brighter than 10 million suns, and yet he could still look into it, and it had this great over, not overwhelming, but the primary sense was of love and he was bring, being drawn toward that. So who is he? That's the issue. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's why I'm asking it in that way. I don't know. <laughs> the, the, the difficulty is the he becomes the non-he. And yet there seemed to be a distinction I, between yes. he and this great thing. That's what's that... driving me crazy. <laughs> It's not a far trip, this driving being crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I heard about the, the friend of mine who had trouble with his memory. So he, he it was getting worse and worse. So finally he went to his old friend, the family physician, and he was explaining this the suffering he was going through with his memory. And the old man listened to it and his advice was, well, forget it. <laughs> it, 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 it is good advice, but only I can accept it. Yeah, forgetting might be release. <laughs> okay, thank you.